Hello there, fellow Sojourners, and welcome back to another edition of Appropriating the Culture. On today's episode, we examine trans athlete Leah Thomas, or the Jackie Robinson of swimming, according to women's gender and sexuality studies professor Cheryl Cookie. Cookie. Cookie sounds about right. I'm Pastor Shane. I'll be your biologist today as we appropriate some culture. <laughs> So as you're probably aware, there's some controversy brewing since Leah Thomas, who is a male that identifies as female, has been competing in women's sports. An NBC News opinion piece by Purdue professor Cheryl Kuki puts it this way. This controversy came to an apex last week at the NCAA Championships when she became the first openly trans athlete to win a Division I championship in any sport. For anyone who cares about the advancement of sports, and women's sports in particular, her win should be celebrated. Thank you! Yes! Someone needs to tell that to the Central Valley Junior Dodgeball Association because my domination should have been celebrated. <laughs> You can't tell me how I identify, and let's be real, age is a far more mutable quality than sex. It changes every year. This year I'm 38, next year who knows, maybe 6, at least during dodgeball season. But Cheryl continues, Women's sports are situated at a paradoxical intersection wherein sex segregation is upheld through claims of biological difference, yet equality is prefaced on being treated the same and given the same opportunities as men. If we are to change this, we we need to ask some important questions. How does one advocate for equitable treatment while also adhering to the notion of biological difference? If separate is not equal in the case of schools, bathrooms, wait, what? Separate but equal doesn't apply to bathrooms? We can't have male bathrooms and female bathrooms? Because I don't know, it just seems to me like we've been doing that for forever. Confusing. Anyway, Cheryl continues, Those who oppose the inclusion of trans women in women's sports argue that trans women have an unfair competitive advantage and that, as a result, they will take away opportunities from cisgender athletes. According to the NCAA, these assumptions are not well founded. Really? Okay, well, let's see what the NCAA says about it. Under the sections of Should the Participation of Transgender Student Athletes Raise Concerns About Competitive Equity, they say, quote, Concern about creating an unfair competitive advantage on sex-separated teams is one of the most often cited reasons for resistance to the participation of transgender student athletes. No, there is no real resistance to the participation of transgender student athletes. The argument is not that transgender people must be precluded from participating in college athletics. The argument is that they must compete in the sex category that matches objective reality, not their internal feelings. That's a sleight of hand, but they continue. These concerns are based on three assumptions. One, that transgender women are not real women and therefore not deserving of an equal competitive opportunity. That's not an assumption, that's a fact. That's a biological reality. Transgender women are not women due to the fact that they are men. The dead giveaway of that is the qualifier. If transgender women were real women, we would just say women. The real unfounded assumption is the assumption that one's internal sense of self is of equal validity and weight to the material reality and empirical evidence. Next assumption. Two, that being born with a male body automatically gives a transgender woman an unfair advantage when competing against non-transgender women. I don't know about automatically, but in general, yes. If there is no distinction between males and females in our species, if there is no competitive advantage, then why do we have sex-separated teams to begin with? The entire reason, the entire reason we have sex-separated sports is because, in general, there is a competitive advantage. Now, that may not be the case in the specific. Some individual women are better athletes than some individual males. Leah Thomas was even defeated in the 100-yard freestyle championship, but rules and guidelines are instituted in general populations. They're not tailored to specific individuals, which is why we have sex-separated
celebrated sports because in the general, men have a competitive advantage over women. If that is not a well-founded assumption, then why do we have sex-separated sports? Next assumption. Three, that men might be tempted to pretend to be transgender in order to compete in competition with women. Of course, no one would ever be tempted in that fashion. Now, wait a minute. I saw something interesting in Forbes. LGBTQ sports history, two out transgender NCAA athletes compete head to head. There's a photo with a caption, Penn's Leah Thomas left, leaves the pool deck as Yale's Isaac Hennig right prepares to swim. There were two transgendered people swimming in that competition. One, a transgendered woman, the other, a transgendered man. And yet, oddly, they're in the same competition. Quote, Transgender man Isaac Hennig of Menlo Park, California, tied for fifth with Louisville Gabby Alborio, finishing at 47.32, a quarter of a second faster than he swam in the morning. Hennig, 20, represented Yale, where he is a junior as their sole entrant. After receiving his trophy, his parents, younger sister, and other supporters congratulated Hennig for his outstanding and historic performance in the pool. He is now a first-team All-American. Although he had top surgery to remove his breasts, he is not on testosterone and postponed that part of his medical transition so he can continue to compete with his women teammates. See, Leah identifies as a woman and so swims with the women, whereas Isaac identifies as a man and so swims with the women. But level of competition is not a factor at all, you silly goose. It's just about comfort. I feel more comfortable about who I am when I'm winning. Of course, it could be tempting to compete in women's competition. People do far worse things for a little bit of fame. That's not tempting. Uh, wh what did he have to give up? He didn't get breast implants. He still has his male parts, according to his swim teammates. And according to the Daily Mail, he's also still attracted to the ladies. So what do we got? We got a dude who grows out his hair a little bit, gets on some hormones for a time, and in exchange, he gets to hang out in the ladies' changing room, win some swim meets, get famous, get praised and applauded by the media, and even compared to freaking Jackie Robinson. But that's not tempting. We see similar sorts of stories coming out of Ukraine. A transgender woman wasn't allowed to leave Ukraine because he's a man, and they're requiring all men of a certain age to stay and fight for their country. At the same time, we have this story about a transgender man bravely fleeing the country. Quote, Andre decided to join the river of desperate refugees flowing west, but needed help from someone who understood his specific situation. How do I show my passport as a man with a female passport? Will they let me through the border as a man, he said? They will, because you're not a man, which is why you have a female passport. Unless you really don't look like your passport anymore, did you have like sex reassignment surgery? Have you had top or bottom surgery? Dublé Wesky asked. Andre hadn't. We decided I had to whisper so that nobody would notice my deep voice. I even painted my nails violet and wore mom's shirt to look more girly. A clever, daring disguise. If they looked closely, they might have discovered that you're a woman. I get it. We're all totally men right up until the point when it's women and children first. Cowardice is not noble, but it's certainly understandable. But don't worry. I am sure when Hollywood makes this into a movie, they'll portray Andre as the ghost of Kiev who shot down numerous Russian warplanes, humiliating and shaming Putin, incurring his wrath to the point that he dispatches an assassin squad. Obviously, he wants to stay and fight, but the legend of the ghost of Kiev must endure. He must not be killed, and so the people implore him to leave. And so, for the sake of Ukraine, he does what he swore he would never do, and bravely resumes the identity he once abandoned, dressing as a woman, and cleverly slips through the clutches of Russian spies and into freedom. Roll credits. But back to Cheryl. Change in sports doesn't happen overnight, nor is it linear. Major professional sports leagues like MLB and the NFL resisted racially integrating their player rosters. It was not until 1962 that the last NFL team, the Washington Commanders, would racially integrate. 
The Washington Commanders did not racially integrate in 1962. The Washington Commanders were not a football team until the year of our Lord 2022. Never trust anyone who rewrites history. But race and sex are obviously not the same degree of distinction, which is why, as you correctly say, Cheryl, the Supreme Court unanimously decided in Brown v. Board of Education that separate is not equal and segregation violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Despite this, sports have been able to operate under a separate but equal framework, upheld in part by the notion of biological difference between the sexes. Yes, because race is not a meaningful distinction in athletics, but sex is. Cheryl continues, Athletic performance is influenced by a number of factors, including hormones, but also other things like coaching and training, psychological makeup of an athlete, access to resources and equipment, among others. Attempts to ban or limit the participation of trans athletes are not based on science. Again, the argument is not that transgender people must be banned or limited from participating in college athletics. The argument is that they must compete in the sex category that matches objective reality because the entire reason we have sex-separated sports is because of the biological advantages of men. And that is evidenced by literally every single athletic record in history and proven every time that there's a pickle jar in a household that needs opening. Men in general are faster and stronger. We run faster, jump higher, hit harder, throw further, and lift more than our female counterparts. Not based on science, that's demonstrably, empirically true. Now look, as Christians, we can have sympathy for people who are genuinely struggling with body dysmorphia. But as a matter of public policy, engaging in delusion is not compassionate. It is not loving to lie to people. And it's not without repercussions. There are real-world consequences to engaging in this delusion, and our public policies and athletic organizations cannot be solely geared to the sensitivities and sensibilities of the few at the expense to all the others. Leah may not be comfortable in a male locker room, but many women are not comfortable with a man in their locker room. Why does Leah's feelings trump all other people's feelings? Are they not people too? Leah's participation precludes female athletes from competition by taking their spot. Why should we be only concerned with trans participation and not care about somebody else being denied an opportunity to compete? Anyway, we'll have to stop there. As always, share, like, subscribe, join my author's Facebook page, follow me on the major socials, and I'll see you next week for more Appropriate in the Culture.